Uh, hi everyone and welcome to another edition of The Digest. Today we are talking to Dr. Kieran Hillier, who is, uh, her background is in clinical and forensic psychology and she spent more than a decade helping people deal with, with mental issues. So we want to kick off with asking questions about COVID. It's had a very a massive impact on the youth, especially who are stuck at home or are not able to socialize as much with their friends and so on. So what is it that makes uh, students or youngsters react like that to isolation and COVID-related uh, lockdown or uh, other issues right now. And because on social media, we see a lot of students making posts and youngsters making posts about how they're feeling and it's become more rampant now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think certainly, I mean, there's, there's so many contributing factors that are going to determine how, how well a child or a teenager or, your, or a young adult is going to cope in this type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, so for some of them, you know, their family is dealing with quite either financially unstable situation um, or job security might be problematic. And if kids are aware of that, um, and they're picking up on parents' stress and anxieties and worries, all very understandable responses to be having, but then kids are going to absorb that, um, and so that's going to have an impact. Uh, also, kind of their, their physical living space can have a, a huge impact, so it might be the case that um, it's quite a small living space for the number of families, particularly if there is... Um, financial stress and so then do you have additional members of the family staying there uh, your access to technology in order to engage in learning is it three children who are sharing one laptop mm -hmm. um, and they're competing with that and then some some schools kind of sh or university structure where like you need to be online at a particular time and then other ones allow more flexibility so then are some kids need seen as more pressing i guess because it's all like you need to be online at this time so therefore we need to prioritize you whereas another child um, maybe the the learning is more flexible so they might end up getting the the laptop or the technology at like the most convenient times for everybody else but that might not be the most convenient time for them um so making all of these accommodations uh, I know with some of some uh, young people who I see on a clinical basis, uh, I do online sessions um, or I do face to face. It depends on where people physically are and what they're comfortable with doing. Um, but for a lot of young people, they are not going to feel comfortable having an online session because they don't have a private space um, to really be able to talk about things without worrying about it being overheard um, either by just a curious younger sibling or an anxious parent who wants to know what's going on. Um, so whether students actually have a sense of privacy and physical space for themselves where they're able to recuperate um, is going to have an impact. Uh, and then you have like just the... Um, the broader issue of uh, adolescence is when um, mental health difficulties start to rear their head for a lot of people. Um, and so then if someone's already vulnerable uh, to difficulties and they're exposed to this additional stressor, is this the thing that's kind of going to tip them over the edge? Schools, the way that they structure it, um, some schools it, they're offering entirely online um, or students are given an option of face-to-face -face, or maybe some year groups are prioritised or students with special needs are going to be prioritised, which I think is um, a valid thing for a lot of schools to be doing. Uh, but then you put this wonderful plan in place as a school or a university and then COVID numbers increase and now it's, oh, we have to close. Um, and so all of those wonderful plans have gone back because kids really thrive off um, consistency um, and a sense of stability and if you don't have that because of what's going on around you um, then that can be really difficult uh, and I guess the last one would be just how well adults and parents are communicating the issues with children I think some parents worry that am I offloading some of my stress and is that just gonna amplify the situation for kids Whereas we often advise people, kids are going to pick up on it anyway. And if you're not communicating, they're going to start interpreting it in a range of different ways, which is potentially even more problematic. They're going to start to blame themselves or take on personal responsibility for what's going on. Um, so often we are 
educating parents and teachers on how to communicate things in an age appropriate and developmentally appropriate way for each different year group that you're working with so that students are understanding um, why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Um, even, even before lockdown, though, um, I noticed I worked an awful lot with students um, as a, an academic advisor. They used to come to me with personal problems as well. Um, and Facebook groups, WhatsApp chats, and, and TikTok, LinkedIn, um, not LinkedIn, um, Snapchat. Snapchat and Instagram. <laughs> They're, Maybe they're, they're moving towards LinkedIn. <laughs> well, that's what I, what I, I did used to push them there, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's, a, there's still an awful lot of neg negativity, negativity around there, and has been for, for quite a number of years. And I know it's, it's different from when I was at school. There was, there was nothing mm -hmm. like that. Maybe there was, but we just didn't have the means to, sort of, to, to express that. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are serious hints of, of, of depression. So um, mm -hmm. why do you think it's so commonplace now? I mean, social media, there's, uh, there's really interesting research that talks about how, um, you know, there are definite positives and negatives to the way that social media is utilised. Um, and so depending on why students are going online, it can either be really helpful for them in terms of building a sense of community and normalising some of those experiences that they've got and sharing resources allowing them to access resources that they might otherwise not be able to access. Um, I remember we were having a conversation with some of my colleagues where it's like a 15 year old who wants to access psychological services, but the parents are not supporting them in doing that. So how do we allow them to get access um, to stuff uh, that might be online? So at least they're getting some support network there. Um, but then you also have the, the potential negative consequences where if there's a lot of, um, upward social comparison. So if you're seeing that everybody else is coping so much better than you are or their life is so much better um, and so then you're saying, oh, compared to everything that's going on for me, I am not coping and therefore there is something wrong with me um, or if social media is used as an extension of cyberbullying. Mm. Um, and again, for some kids being taught online is actually giving them a, a, a sense of safety and a bit of a buffer to protect them from maybe some of the, the bullying that they're exposed to. Um, whereas other kids, it's just an extension for um, people to maybe access them and they don't get any uh, recovery from that type of thing. So um, a lot of the time it'll be sort of asking students, uh, what is it that you're wanting to get out of your interactions on social media? Um, and then educating them on, you know, some common psychological fallacies that we might engage in. So a one I talk about a lot with them is, uh, you know, that social media posts are going to be very carefully tailored um, and people are choosing to share certain things. So you've got maybe insight into 2% of what's going on in that person's life and you're comparing that to 100% of what you know is going on for you. So you're comparing apples to oranges there. Um, and so then you're, you're going to set yourself up because who shares all the negative stuff that they're going through on, on social media? Um, so there's that side. I guess in terms of, uh, you know, are we seeing uh, increased diagnoses of mental illness and indications of mental illness and symptoms of that um, across young people? I would say yes. Um, where, how much of that is due to, uh, you know, as we become more aware of things, as stigma starts to slowly decrease, so more people are seeking out services. Um, and so then we're just, uh, you know, was it the same rate was always there? We're just getting better at identifying um, and diagnosing and supporting those students who need that support. Um, or is it that the way that modern society is kind of um, structured, uh, for example, that there is a lot of online and um, communications and so we have a million friends um, online and yet we might feel really, really isolated um, in our own skin. Uh, that, that's, that's a really tricky one, I think, to try and tease apart. Um, but uh, there's, there's certainly plenty of research that shows that when it comes to mental illnesses, we do see, for a lot of people, we'll see the first indications of that um, through the, te the teenage years. And so some questions are around, like, the biology, that they're going through a lot of biological changes at that point, and so is there something to do with that? 
that's triggering it? Is it that developmental process where, you know, teenage years are when you're devising that sense of autonomy and independence and that separate identity to um, that of the rest of your family? And so then peers become really important and peer groups and family, friends, cliques and stuff in schools can get very, um, what's the word, uh, fragile, I guess, and they're constantly changing um, and kids can be best friends with one person and then rejected by that person the following week and that can be really confusing. Um, and so then is it, is it that combination of you're really wanting to um, separate yourself and establish your own identity but you're not sure what that actually is and everybody else is doing that at the same time and so they're going to be trialing things out and you might be um, some unintended uh, friendly fire almost in that process for, for someone else. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really tough period um, of any person's life, I think, that transition from um, young adolescence into becoming a young adult. You talked about uh, biological factors or something that adolescents could be going through, but what about external factors in today's, mm -hmm. how today's society is structured? Apart from social media, what are the most difficult mm -hmm. pressures that these youngsters are going through and what advice would you give them to cope with, you know, to go better? I, a lot of students that I will see, they're kind of terrified of the idea of, well, what if this isn't what I want to do? What if I get two years into my degree? And I realize that this is not what I want. Um, and so there's a lot of fear around how do I even have this conversation with my parents? That's going to be seen as a waste of money. Do I just stick with it and see how I go and then hopefully come back to it? But then your life continues and you need a job. And so then do you realize it's 10 years later and you've never been able to do um, what you what you wanted to do? Sure. So I think that just the educational system is, is really quite... Um, the way that it's presented to students is you have to do really, really well in your final school exams or your life is over. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the intention, but that's the message that students get. Um, and so, of course, then we see like rates of self-harm and suicide attempts and um, just really maladaptive coping strategies. They all go up during that exam period. Uh, and so... Sometimes then I, it's trying to stress to students, but also to family members as well, uh, that, you know, no education. If, some, if a child changes their mind, that's totally okay. It's not like their previous education was a waste of time. Um, that's, they're still going to use that knowledge uh, in just a different way. Uh, but then you might also be working with some quite um, rigid expectations from, from parents or family members uh, and helping a student to kind of cope with that where even if they, you know, are they doing a degree because they're not particularly interested in it, but how, what other outlets can they have um, in order to get that sense of life satisfaction and fulfilment? Yeah. Ideally, you would want it to be in your job because that's what we're doing most of our waking hours. Um, but for some people, we've also got to be realistic um, and fair to them that there's all of these other factors that they're needing to consider when making a huge decision like that. Um, so can they identify other ways um, that they can get that sense of fulfillment for themselves? Uh, do parents ever mistake uh, depression in, in youngsters as a sign of uh, seeking attention? Do you ever come across that? And then what mm -hmm. advice do you have for them then? Yeah, ooh, that's a good question. Um, there's definitely, uh, and you know, working in um, the GCC in the MENA region, there's just not as much awareness um, of mental health issues compared to other parts of the world. I think that is slowly changing, but it's still certainly there. Um, and so it'll be like, is this some form of manipulation, I guess, like that they're attention seeking um, or they're doing it to get what they want or they're just um, doing it to assert their authority and they're trying to rebel. Uh, and so explaining to them, you know, yes, there's a, there's a wide spectrum in terms of behaviour, um, but where it becomes sort of where we need to identify when it's problematic is if this is really creating a lot of distress 
um, either for your child or for you guys at home because it's creating so much conflict. If we can understand, you might not necessarily agree when a child says, when you use that word, like when you call me stupid, I get really upset at that. Um, the parent might go, that's weird. Like my parents called me stupid um, and I, it never bothered me. We go, okay, but uh, it's not that you have to think the same way. It's now that you know if your child is telling you that this way of communicating really bothers them and we're also suggesting, okay, how what would be an okay way to communicate, um, then are you going to take that on uh, because, you know, your end goal is for your child to be coping really well and to thrive and to be resilient and this is a, an extra bit of information that you know about your child. Are you going to absorb that and then go, okay, now that I know that, it's my responsibility to do something proactive with this information and this new knowledge that I've got? Or are you going to disregard it? And then that invalidation for kids um, can just further amplify like, oh, great, because then they learn, I try and be open with you, yeah. And you're disregarding what I'm requesting. <clears throat> so what's the point in sharing it with you? And then they close off. You know, there's certain things that we don't have control over. Yes, we don't have control over COVID. We don't have control over the government mandates that they choose to implement. We don't have control over what our school chooses to do. Um, but what do I have some control over? You know, do I have control over... Uh, how do I want to set up the physical space at home? It might not be ideal, but how do I make it like as good as possible for me? Um, and if I'm having these issues with my parents, how do I try and work out a better way to express that and communicate that with them? Um, so that, you know, any, anything that you're doing, it's because you're choosing to do it. When we're in the classroom with, with students, we can see those who are a, a little bit more timid. And so, you know, we've got the, the sort of the visual pointers. Um, mm. We can, you know, the, whether it's a sort of, I don't know, gut feeling or, or intuition or whatever. But you can tell when there's, you, you, uh, much of the time, you can tell when there's something wrong. Now, as we haven't got that at the moment, what mm. kind of signs might, might someone, be able, or might a teacher be able to look out for to, you know, to see if, if, if there are problems? Right. Yeah, that's a really good question. Because um, even now, uh, with students being online, we actually don't want them to turn on their cameras a lot of the time because of a bandwidth issue. So, um, and so then you can look at ways of how to make things as interactive as possible. Um, so an example might be our platform allows us to use breakout groups. So then you'll put the, everybody into groups and I might say, you're going to be all chatting to each other for the next 15 minutes about this problem. And then I'll be jumping in across all the different groups um, just to see how much engagement is going on as well as maybe steering them in the right direction if they're going a little bit off topic or something. But then that allows you to see, okay, when it's a smaller environment, um, they tend to be a bit more comfortable turning on their microphones or um, contributing in the chat just uh, our platform allows us, you know, you can see who's attended. So uh, this is more useful for continuing students. But if I've already got a bit of a relationship with a student and I know this student when we were teaching um, face to face always came um, and was engaged in the stuff and then I'm looking going, oh, like they haven't been there for the last four weeks, then I will, uh, that's part of our responsibilities is I'll check what attendance is like and I tell my students I'm not doing this to sort of penalize you um, but I'm doing it to check in on you so if I if a student hasn't attended for like three weeks then I email them and I go hey um, how are things going uh, do you feel like you're staying on top of the material anything any issues coming up that I can help you with and some of them will go yeah it's just you know the timing of the class I'm still sleeping then but I watch the recordings but thank you for checking in and then you're okay. And then other ones will go, actually, like it's been really stressful because of A, B or C. And then it's okay. Well, let's, um, you know, do you want to have a one-on-one -on -one session to catch up on any of the materials? Uh, so we have mitigating circumstances. So students can apply for, um, uh, you know, if they submit something late that we can take that into consideration in our marking. 
um, you know, longer, sort of more drastic measures, I guess, are things like temporary suspension of studies, um, connecting them with the wellbeing office, so um, highlighting to them like the number of resources that we have. Harriet Watt also has a really nice personal tutor system, so um, each student is allocated an academic member of staff who is their personal tutor for the rest of their academic career unless they change degrees or something and then they're assigned to someone else. But, um, and that way we have regular meetings with the students. Uh, and you'll just, sometimes they're like five minutes and the student's like, yeah, I'm good. You go, okay, bye. <laughs> and then other times um, you'll look at their grades and you go, oh, you know, oh, you did well here. Like, this is a bit unusual. Like, was it just the, the course material or, um, and so I think students like to know that there's someone um, just there, like this extra set of eyes that we have. And then, so I might, if a student is, is in my class and I think, oh, this is a little, I'm a little worried, um, I can go into the system and I can see who their personal tutor is and then I might email them and uh, they might say, oh, yes, I've been in contact with this student, so we're good or, oh, thank you for letting me know and then they will contact them. So we've got a few systems in place there. Um, to check in. So it's, it's um, I think letting students, having those types of systems in place, um, I think is really helpful. Uh, and also um, empowering staff to, that it's okay to step in. Um, I think sometimes staff are almost, oh, what if it's an actual problem and then I have to deal with it? <laughs> so it's better if I just don't ask. And it can be, look, just because it's been identified doesn't mean you have to then deal with it. If you don't feel equipped to do that, then you would direct the student to these other resources that we have. So it's also educating the staff um, that it's not uh, your responsibility to, to fix it. But if you identify something, then I, I think it is your responsibility to let the, the responsible and the relevant people know about that, and then they will pick up on that. Okay, speaking about the staff, what about the educators, especially school teachers who have so much responsibility? I mean, not only are they supposed to teach under these circumstances, then cope with the students uh, being stressed out and unpredictability, more workload, pay cuts, their own children at home sometimes studying. So what about the mental health and well-being of teachers, in, even in, I mean, before COVID and during COVID? Um, yeah. Do you have any general advice for that? <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think teachers uh, like all due respect to them, and um, you know, as a as a university professor, I feel like well, at least I'm working with students who are kind of used to um, self initiated learning and being more independent, and so then um, I don't need to watch so carefully. But you're right with school students, particularly primary school. Um, and just what we know around like students being able to engage in looking at a computer for an hour or something. Yeah, like my hat is off to them. I think they're doing an amazing job. Um, plus, as you said, like the, uh, not only are they teaching, but sometimes there's, oh, I have to teach the same material face to face and online, um, because some students can't be here. Uh, and then some change will happen and this beautiful plan that I've put together, um, goes out mm -hmm. the window. To teachers, I would say, like, just, um, you know, there's no such thing as perfection because what is perfect for one student is going to be awful for another student. You can only optimise, like, what is it that your learning style that you enjoy because that's what the students are going to pick up on, um, that you're engaged and that you're working in a way uh, that... Um, that you're liking and so that's they're going to pick up on that enthusiasm uh, and it's so it might be some people we get quite uh, I've worked with some teachers and we get quite rigid like around okay you are only going to work on this um, class plan for two hours and then that's it if you don't get it done in those two hours doesn't get done um, so we might do it in that way or it can be more well let's try this and see what the students say because I've had one experience and the teacher was working on things for six hours and then we're like let's just you know bring it down to two and she's like they didn't even notice <laughs> <laughs> which is almost like oh <laughs> but it's well isn't that interesting um, because that's maybe you know you think that their focus is on a 
and that's not what their focus is on. Um, so yeah, I think um, telling telling teachers that um, your your well being needs to be your priority um, because ultimately that is your responsibility. You know, your your school or your institution can say a lot of things, but you, they're not going to know your specific circumstances. Um, so you need to decide for you, like, what's what's a manageable workload for me? Um, and, yes, everybody's going to have work where there's certain periods of time um, during a semester or a term where things get busy. And that's okay as long as we know that this is a short-term thing and then after that I can sort of relax. But when it's chronic and then you feel like I never get a chance to recover, you're just setting it up. Um, for you to to completely burn out at some point, and then students lose a good teacher. You start to disengage um, with what you're teaching. It builds up resentment. You no longer enjoy what you're doing. Nobody wins um, from that perspective. Yeah.